Hello everybody out there in Bourbon Real Talk land. Randy Sullivan coming to you today with a very special episode. I can't tell you how excited I am about this one. It has been an absolute journey to gather the information necessary for this episode. And what we are going to talk about today is this vintage bottle of Four Roses. Uh, we are going to date this bottle. You are going to be shocked at the clues that we were able to pull together from the packaging of this bottle, how accurately we were able to predict what year it came from, we even know what season it came from, and we're gonna go over all of that, and then we are gonna open this bad boy, and we are gonna taste it. So you're going to want to stick around. Now, first off, let's talk about Four Roses. Why is it called Four Roses? Well, you can go to the website and you can read the story about the founder, Paul Jones, and his marriage proposal. And he asked some Belle of the Ball to be his wife. And she said, when we go to the next gala, if I'm wearing flowers on my shirt, then you will know that I have said yes to your proposal. Absolute malarkey. The truth is, Paul Jones died a bachelor. He never got married. That's a completely made up marketing story. So then the question is, why Four Roses, right? And there was some early marketing pieces that indicated that there was a Rose family and they had four daughters and maybe Paul Jones was interested in the, the four Rose daughters. But there's really nothing to support that either. But then I came across this little tidbit of information. And there was an, a, a Victorian style of business communication that involved sending flowers to one another and Paul Jones, the founder, would have definitely been aware of this. And when you wanted to make a business proposal to somebody, you sent the proposal with the flower. If they wanted to acknowledge receipt, they sent two back. If they wanted to reject, they sent three back. But if they wanted to accept, they sent four back. And so it is believed that Paul Jones named his brand Four Roses because it was the whiskey that you would drink to celebrate when you had just consummated a business deal. So I believe that's where the Four Roses name came from, even though that's not the official story. Uh, Paul Jones registered the trademark for Four Roses in 1888, and he died in 1905. Um, and, and you've got that whole story with the Four Roses. I, I, I think that that's so super interesting. Um, but because he did die a bachelor, it's, it's probably not likely that it was the marriage proposal idea. So now we want to figure out what is this bottle even? right? Because it's obviously very old. And so I went on a journey to try and date this bottle so I could figure out what it was. And there's little tidbits of information all over these vintage bottles. And every time you find a little marking or a saying or a phraseology or whatever, that might be the key that you need to find it, but it might not. And so you go down that rabbit hole and you start to do research and you discover other amazing things and eventually, hopefully, you come to a conclusion like we did. And so let's learn a little bit about this history and let's taste it. So first off, let's talk about the packaging that this bottle comes in. So I, I actually have multiples of these bottles. I bought four and three of them came in these sealed boxes and one of them had already been removed from the box. And so the first clue that I wanted to investigate is this packaging. And you can see um, that the, the, there is actually a patent number on the top of this box. And the box says right here, sealed for safety, okay? And then down here at the bottom, it says patent number 1732059. And you're like, sealed for safety? Well, part of the reason why I wanted to do this podcast is because this box represents a piece of whiskey heritage, okay? And understand that we had prohibition in the United States, I believe from 1919 to 1933, December 5th, 1933. And that was able to get passed because back then, whiskey was not very safe. You would go to a local like uh, grocery store or your local pharmacy, and you would fill up your jug of whiskey out of their barrel that they had. But they may have adulterated that barrel to stretch it to make it last longer. There were putting all kinds of unsafe things into the whiskey and people would drink it and get sick and sometimes they would die. And so the prohibitionists were able to use that as an argument to get the government to pass prohibition. But they also passed medicinal uh, laws that allowed individuals who had a prescription from a doctor to still buy alcohol. And there were six distilleries that were still allowed to operate and sell whiskey during prohibition 
and Four Roses was one of them. And that means that Four Roses has been operating continuously since 1888, um, but they trace their history back to the 1860s. Whether or not that's just marketing hype or not, no one will really ever know. Uh, but they were known for their innovative packaging because they were having to create packaging during this time frame that there was a lot of pressure to make sure that the whiskey hadn't been, hadn't been tampered with. And so that's what this box is. That's what this patent is about, right? Uh, so this is a prohibition era patent that was for medicinal whiskey. And what's so super interesting about this patent is that one of my good friends, uh, Ronald Lou, from Someone Say Whiskey the Club is a patent attorney. And I told him about this piece and he asked me for the photo of the patent number and he looked it up and here it is. You can actually go look up this patent and scroll through and see what the original patent was for. Now, most patents for packaging are design patents and they're trying to get protection for that particular design. But this patent was a more uh, protected category called a utility patent. And the utility of this patent was that the box itself was crimped into the metal top and bottom. And you can read it right there, that that's its purpose, that it was for medicinal whiskey and to crimp it inside the box so that you could not get access to the bottle without damaging the box. Therefore, a consumer that received a bottle that the box had not been destroyed knew already that that whiskey was safe to drink because it came straight from the licensed manufacturer and had not been tampered with. So that's the purpose of this patent. And that's the purpose of this box. And that's why this bottle and box of whiskey is so historically significant for you and I, because this was the way forward. This was the way out of prohibition was to be able to come up with delivery methods so that producers could produce whiskey and get it into the hands of consumers and not have to uh, worry about tampering. And so if it wasn't for this patent and the work that was done um, to, to make sure that whiskey was safe for consumers to drink, we may still have prohibition to this day. So this box is historically significant. Now, it does say that the patent was issued on October the 15th, 1929. And so we are gonna start off in aging this bottle stating that we know that this bottle was bottled after October 15th, 1929. We know that, but we don't know how young it could be. So I continued to look around on the box. This box happens to not have it. This box has the, the best representation of, the, of, of the, the seal. But one of the other boxes I had, had a eggnog recipe on the side of it. And when you read the eggnog recipe, it said it could be used with Paul Jones whiskey or with Four Roses because the Frankfurt Distillery produced both Four Roses whiskeys and Paul Jones, the, fa the, the whiskey named after the founder. And I tried to look to see what year Paul Jones whiskey went out of production because I figured I know it's out of production and that could put an op upper limit to how young this whiskey could be, but I couldn't find anything. So that turned out to be one of those dead ends. So the next thing that we wanna talk about is the bottle size. When you look at these old vintage bottles, one of the big questions is, do they use the imperial system or the metric system to tell you what size the bottle is? And the reason why that's significant is because in 1979, the US switched from the imperial system to the metric system. And so when I look at this particular bottle, it states that it is a one pint bottle, which is imperial. So now I know that my bottle is from somewhere between 1929 and 1979. Now we go to the next clue. The next clue was this little disclaimer that's on the back of the bottle. So right here it says, federal law prohibits sale or reuse of this bottle. And they didn't want anybody selling these bottles because they were worried that somebody could fill it back up with unsafe whiskey. So that was a statement that came out of Prohibition era. And so I went and I did some research and it started in 1935 and that law went off the books in the 50s. But there were, I think it was 1954, but there were still manufacturers that were producing whiskey um, that had that, that statement in the bottle because it was so expensive 
to redo your bottle cast that even though it wasn't federally required, they kept producing bottles so they didn't have to pay for a new cast for a few years. And from what I read, you were still seeing bottles come out with that statement all the way up through the late 1960s. And so that takes us a little bit younger. So now we're between 1924 and as late as say, you know, 1960, somewhere in there, okay? Now we're gonna move on to the tax strip. Now the tax strip might be the most important information depending on what color it is because there's different types of tax strips. Now, first off, these tax strips were another tampering uh, prevention device, right? So um, they say that it was a tamper-proof seal so that if your tax strip was in, intact like this one is, you knew that nobody had opened up this bottle so they couldn't have done anything to the whiskey inside. Uh, but this started in 1897 with the Bottled and Bond Act because any whiskeys that were bottled and bond would have had a tax strip and they developed a system so that the bottled and bond whiskeys had a green tax strip. The tax strips for any whiskeys that were being distributed overseas were blue, but post prohibition in 1934, they started using the tax strips for all whiskeys. And honestly, the main purpose of the tax strip was to make sure that the producer had paid the government the taxes for that particular whiskey because probably the real reason prohibition ended was because the government was tired of not collecting all of that tax revenue. But they had to placate the public and say, hey, we're making sure that it's safe and so on and so forth. And so the, um, the, every producer would have an area that was the bonded area. There was a, a tax uh, person from the IRS that they were the ones that had the keys to that area, the, uh, the distillery, and nobody could get in or get out. They were the first in, they were the last out every single day. And then whenever you bottled your whiskey, you put one of these tax strips on it to make sure that the taxes had been paid and that it hadn't been tampered with. Now, if your tax strip is blue, you're gonna have all the information about when the whiskey was put in the barrel, when it was dumped and all of that stuff, and you're gonna know the exact year. Uh, but if it's red, now you got a little bit of problems. But the good news is, is they didn't use the same tax strip the entire time. They used tax strips from 1934 to 1985, uh, but they made little changes every so often throughout the year, okay? Um, now, you'll still see bottles that have these, even though they're not legally required anymore and it's not part of the tax collection system. Um, back in the early 80s, they came to the conclusion that it was a whole lot more efficient for the government to do random audits of producers and have them maintain their own books than it was to try and keep somebody there 24 hours a day, basically making sure that nobody ever did anything with the whiskey. It just wasn't necessary anymore. But you'll still see these tax strips today but they're not real tax strips. And a lot of people think that producers still use them because people just got used to seeing them on the bottle and it represented safety and quality. And so even after they weren't required, people would still use them. Uh, but the good news is, is that you can go online right now um, and you can uh, Google, you know, what year was my bottle from based on the tax strip and you will find a blog post that shows all the different variations of this red tax strip, okay? And all the little changes that took place. And when you zoom in on this, there's an eagle on this tax strip. And the first change that they made was they put some little statements on either side of the eagle, and this one doesn't have it. And that statement change came in 1944, and tax strips like this red one came into effect in 1934. So before we were thinking it was from 1929 to 1960s, now we know that this bottle is from somewhere between 1934 and 1944. Uh, so we're getting a little bit closer, we're zeroing in. So the next thing that we wanna look at is that this is actually not a bourbon. It says that it is a blend of straight whiskey. And if you look on the back, it says a blend, a blend of straight whiskey, 90 proof. And it, it says that, that, that it's all straight whiskeys, but it doesn't say that it's bourbon. And so now you've got a little bit more information that you can start you know, doing research on. So, after Paul Jones died in 1905, his nephew, Lawrence Jones, took over. And Lawrence Jones died in 1941. Um, in 1943, the Seagram's Corporation, which was a Canadian-based beverage conglomerate, came in and bought Four Roses. And they already owned the MGPI distillery um, that, that is in Lawrenceburg, uh, um, 
Lawrenceburg, Indiana. Um, and so I started to do research to see when did Four Roses start making blended whiskey? Hey there, Bourbon Real Talk listeners and watchers. Randy Sullivan here. Wanted to take a quick break to tell you how you can support the channel. We've had a lot of people that have come into the Bourbon Real Talk family lately, and we're grateful for every one of you. But unlike a lot of other channels, we don't have a Patreon, and I don't allow anyone to sponsor the show. So what I do have, though, is some merchandise. We have Bourbon Real Talk hats. We've got Bourbon Real Talk t-shirts. Very soft, high quality. We also have Whiskey Wife t-shirts for the long-suffering significant others in our lives. We have full-size glens for when you need an official whiskey tasting experience. We have wee glens for when, you know, you want to drink a little bit less, maybe try a few extra samples. We have insulated tumblers for when you want to drink incognito. We have full-size glen lanyards for when you need hands-free access at a bottle share. We've got candles, including charcoal and tonka, leather, and Cuban cigar. We have one and two ounce whiskey sample storage boxes. And of course, we have the American Whiskey Aroma Kit for when you want to step your whiskey game up and be able to break a whiskey down to its components. If you saw any of this stuff, you want to support the channel, you can head on over to bourbonrealtalk.com forward slash shop and pick something up. But if you just want to hang out here and learn, I'm totally happy with that as well. Just happy to have you as a listener. So Seagram's Corporation buys Four Roses, and I'm doing research to figure out when they started to do the blending versus the bourbon and all that stuff. And I find out that Samuel, and I don't know if I'm saying this right, but uh, Bonfman, 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 who was the owner of Seagram's, and he made all of his money during Prohibition bootlegging whiskey across the Canadian border into the U.S., so whenever Prohibition ended, he had tons of capital to do whatever it was he wanted to build a legitimate business. And he ended up buying Four Roses, which this shocked me, was the number one selling straight Kentucky bourbon in the United States in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. So post-Prohibition, everybody who loved bourbon would have known the Four Roses name. And I believe that's probably because they were able to pick up market share during Prohibition because they had the medicinal license to be what people were buying. They had a quality product, so afterwards, people just kept purchasing it. So then it's like, okay, this is all useful information, but when did they start making a blend? Well, what I discovered was in the late 1950s, Bonfman stopped bourbon production in the United States for Four Roses, and it's for a completely messed up reason. Is it because nobody wanted the bourbon? No, it was the number one bourbon in the United States. It was simply because of this. He was a Canadian and he hated the fact that his Canadian whiskey wasn't the number one selling whiskey in the US. And he owned the number one selling whiskey in the US and he was so petty that he shut down bourbon production just so that his brand could rise to, to prominence. But he wasn't an idiot so he continued to sell bourbon overseas and to this day Four Roses has a huge following in Japan and in Europe because of that fact. Um, and so I started seeing that, what did they sell in the United States? Well, they sold a, a blended American whiskey uh, in, starting in the late 50s, but that didn't have anything to do with this bottle because this bottle obviously came from before 1944 based on the tax strip. So I was able to surmise, well, if they started making blended whiskeys after uh, the... Seagram's took over, um, and they took over in 1943, and it couldn't be after 1944, I came to the conclusion that this whiskey must be from 1944, right? Because they were making blended whiskeys, you know, had it, they, it couldn't have been before that. And so I actually thought that my journey was over. I was wrong. I had sent a message to Walter C. Hurst. He doesn't have his own website, but he's a frequent contributor on drinksplanet.com. He's a professional appraiser. So if you have bottles like this and you need to get an appraisal for an insurance policy or whatever, he's your guy, right? And so he says, hey, if you have a bottle, you want some information about it, take some good pictures, send them to me. I couldn't believe it. He reaches out to me like three hours after I emailed him, and it turns out that he watches the podcast sometimes, which was mind-blowing to me because I can't believe any of y'all watch the podcast. But anyway, grateful that y'all do. 
So he is like, oh man, that's so cool. And he starts sending me information about this. And he's like, okay, so first off, Four Roses did make blended spirits prior to Seagram's purchasing them because of shortages that they had left over from Prohibition. Because even though they had a license to sell whiskey during Prohibition, they weren't actually producing whiskey until towards the very end of Prohibition because the government didn't allow it until they realized they were going to run out of medicinal whiskey, right? And so everybody's uh, supplies had been depleted. And they were trying to fire up production and get more, you know, whiskey out there, considering they were number one, they needed more. But the issue also was that they had some distillery fires. So there were three distillery fires in the 1930s that actually either stopped production or destroyed inventory or both. And so they had shortages. And as a result, they were buying whiskey from whoever they could. They wanted to sell straight whiskey because they had a good brand. And so they were buying straight whiskeys and they were blending them together. So they were making blended whiskeys before. So my previous theory that it had to be 1944 is now out the door. So I'm like, okay, now what do we do? So this genius, Walter Hurst, sees this tiny, tiny remnant of this little sticker on the back of the bottle. Now, I had seen this sticker, and because I have four bottles, I only sent him pictures of one, by the way. So that's all he saw. That's it. I've seen the other stickers. They're all damaged. None of them had any dates on them that were anything that you can read. And so I was like, well, I guess that's a dead end. I could see that it was from California. He couldn't even see that. He sees that little bitty thing and he says, hey, I have great news for you. I'm able to narrow down what year this bottle could be significantly based on that sticker. He sends me a picture of the whole sticker because he has a bottle and he's cataloged it that has the same sticker on it that was not damaged. And he said, this sticker was used in, the, uh, in California post-prohibition to show that they had paid the state taxes and that sticker was used from about 1935 to the early 1940s. He said, but they changed the color of the sticker every few years. And that particular color of teal was only used in 1937 and 1938. <sighs> Mind blown. I'm like, this dude saw a remnant of a sticker and recognized the color of the millions of potential bottles that are out there. That is amazing. He said another thing that's gonna help us date it is the fact that it has a tin cup on it. The distilleries were affected by WW2, right? And that's because they had to reposition themselves to provide resources for the war effort. And there were certain resources that they were accustomed to using that the government didn't want them using up for something recreational like, like drinking. And one of those things was tin. So the fact that this has a tin uh, cup that's on the top, so the lid's a tin cup that doubles as kind of like a shot glass, is significant. And he said that they actually stopped using these tin cups at Four Roses in mid-1939, right? And so we've got a sticker that was used in 37, 38, and we've got a, a tin cup that went away in 1939. So now we're between 37 and 39, right? Uh, the other thing that he said was significant was on the back, it states that this is a blend of straight whiskey, but that it's 90 proof. And that was pretty much the clincher. Apparently, um, because of their shortages in bourbon and their desire to get above a four-year age statement, they were trying to stretch their whiskey a little bit further. So in early 1938, they switched their proof from 94 proof to 90 proof. And so that leads us to the final clincher, and that is that it says on here that this is a straight whiskey made of all product that's at least three and a half years old. And what came along with that reduction in proofing came also with an increase in age statement. So in mid-1939, Four Roses took their age statement up to four years which is something that we now consider as kind of the you know, minimum standard for whiskey in the United States. Of course, there's exceptions. We don't need to get into that now. Uh, the other thing that he said was super significant and I found super fascinating was underneath that statement that we read earlier, there were some codes. It says D11, 56, and 8. And what he said was D11 is the design code for this particular bottle. The 56 was the factory location code and the eight was the production date code. And eight meant that this bottle was made in 1938. So we've got between 37 and 39, 
but given all of the information, when the tax stamp was used, when the proofing changes happened, he said to me that he is 100% certain that this bottle was bottled in the fall of 1938. I just can't believe it. I mean, the fact that you're able to get that specific with a bottle that's this old, um, I even communicated with people from Four Roses and they had no idea about this bottle. So there's just this brilliant man out there that has all this information in his head. Um, and I'm gonna give you his contact information if you happen to have any vintage bottles like this a little bit later, but I will say, if you are going to reach out to him, make sure you're not sending him pictures of a bottle that has a UPC code on it. That means that it was bottled within the last 35 or 40 years, and you don't need his help. He specializes in bottles that are like pre-prohibition, post-prohibition bottles. Um, and so that's kind of where we're at with that. So uh, let's talk about your obvious questions about this bottles, right? Because most of you are going, okay, all of this is well and good, awesome story. Where did you find four bottles of 1938 Four Roses? And the truth is one of you called me, right? Um, somebody reached out to me from the website and then I sent them my contact information. Uh, this was an individual that, that trades in antique lighters and in his you know, searching, he found these four bottles. He bought them, he reached out to me and said, hey, do you have any idea what these are worth? He had also reached out to Four Roses and after doing a little bit of research, I decided I was willing to pay the price he wanted. I bought all four bottles. Um, I am going to donate one of the four sealed bottles to Four Roses. Haven't exactly decided which one because some of the bottles or some of the boxes are in better shape than others. Um, I thought about giving one that's got like a rotted out bottom on it so that they could take the bottle out and you could see both the box and the bottle on display um, since the bottom doesn't really have much to do with the story. Um, so I don't know, we haven't figured that out, but I have been in communication with Brent Elliott and I am going to be donating a bottle. Um, I will say that Four Roses has been great through this whole process. Um, Brent Elliott offered to take a sample from the open bottle and run, it, run analysis on it, but we discovered that we weren't re really gonna get that much useful information. They can't even tell what grain it was made from. And since I was too excited, I didn't wanna wait for all of that. So we went ahead and did this piece. And you probably wanna know how much I paid for the bottles. Uh, my good friend, Brad Bonds, owns uh, Revival uh, Spirits in Covington, Kentucky. The website is revivalky.com. They sell vintage spirits like this. And they had a bottle that was similar to this bottle from the 1940s. It was 1,250 bucks. I figure he's got at least 100% markup. So I offered the gentleman who had these bottles 650 or $625 per, exactly 50% of what the retail was. He felt like that was a fair price. So I bought all four bottles for 650 or 625 bucks a piece. So that way you don't have to be curious. So now we're gonna open this bad boy and taste it. So I, as I mentioned, I have three that are in this original sealed box. One's going to Four Roses. The fourth bottle is this one and it came outside of the box. So this is the one that we're going to open. The fill level is not great. So when you buy these vintage bottles, they talk about fill level. And I'm guessing that somewhere around 30% of this bottle has already evaporated. Um, and when you see that often, the whiskey that's inside the bottle has been affected by that you know, evaporation over time. It's probably lost a lot of ethanol. That changes which um, flavor molecules are in active state inside this bottle. Chemical reactions start to happen that were held in suspense by the higher proof. Um, the, the, CO, the dissolved CO2 changes in here and it changes the pH and that also changes its flavor and what chemical reactions can happen. So I'm not expecting a lot out of this bottle, but I also don't expect it to be dangerous to drink. Um, so for those of you out here that are about to uh, have a heart attack because I'm cutting a tax strip that's been in place for almost 90 years, just remember that whiskey was meant to be drank. I do have to say, this does break my heart a little bit. But keep in mind that the history is the bottle and not the whiskey. So we're gonna have that forever. So I'm guessing this is a screw top. Feels like it. Oh, it's a double screw top. Okay, so this is just the shot glass. 
and it's double threaded. So you've got the, the bottom thread that holds the shot glass on, and then you've got this top piece. Louisville and Baltimore with hands shaking, which is kind of interesting. And the reason why that's interesting is because the distillery itself is in Louisville. Uh, it's actually in, um, in uh, Lawrenceburg, uh, but Louisville was where uh, their corporate offices were. But I think that their corporation was incorporated in Baltimore. And so that may be why that's on here. All right, let's see if we can unscrew this piece. So the, it was under vacuum, or no, it was under pressure. So whenever I opened it up, it spewed a little bit of liquid out through the edge. And that's what causes these bottles to, to breathe. Um, on the inside, we've got quite a bit of corrosion, almost a patina. And this, there's a, a metal cap Oh, okay, okay, I've never seen this before. So this is um, kind of like a, a, another uh, tamper-proof seal like the, that you would get on a modern medicine with, um, it, it almost looks like um, foil that's stuck on there. And it's got some damage. It even looks like there's some holes in it potentially, but I can see what they were trying to do. Yeah, it did, it corroded through. It's got some, some holes in it. But that's super interesting. Smells a little like whiskey, so <laughs> that's good. All right, let's pour a little up. So one of the things that I look for in these dusty whiskeys is how cloudy the whiskey is. Because I have noticed that there seems to be a correlation between cloudiness and the whiskey having degraded in the bottle. And this whiskey is on the cloudier side. Um, I've seen some that are just only slightly hazy. This one is a little more hazy. And this whiskey smells like medicine. <laughs> This doesn't smell at all like uh, caramel and sweet bourbon. It, it has a very medicinal smell to it. Um, it. It does smell old. It smells, uh, I don't know. It, it, it smells like a clean, like a sterilization agent. Like a hospital almost, but not like uh, smoky, like a Isla Scotch, you know? It just, it smells like more like a sterilization agent. Let's see how it tastes. Doesn't taste bad, actually. So on the palate up front, you get hit with that, um, I don't know, it's almost, it, I don't want to say rubbing alcohol because it's not an ethanol -y smell, it just, it smells like a, a, a clean hospital and that hits you right up front. But then the mid palate, there's still a, there, there is some sweetness to this. A little bit of sweetness on the mid palate. But the finish is pretty, pretty unremarkable. I mean, all of it's pretty unremarkable. It's, it's, it's just, it's just tastes like whiskey a hint of sweetness. There's no complex flavor. I'm not getting, you know, leather or tobacco or anything like that. Um, but considering that this was a whiskey that was released five short years after Prohibition ended, under five years after Prohibition ended, and there was a major shortage and they had had three fires and they were just trying to put things together that were drinkable to keep the public's appetite wet, right? Um, I'd say it's, it's pretty interesting. Plus it's been sitting here in this bottle for a very long time. Um, so all in all, I'm not mad at it. Super interesting. I hope you enjoyed it. If this is the first time that you're watching Bourbon Real Talk, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our show philosophy. So our show is about bringing people together through whiskey. Whiskey has a superpower, if you will. 
to bring people together from all walks of life, race, religion, sexual orientations, colors, whatever the case may be. And I want people to feel connected. I lost a, a, a loved one a few years ago to suicide. And it was shocking to me that he was in that place. I knew he had problems, but I, I just didn't understand that he felt that hopeless and desperate and alone. And I know that there has to be other people out there that are silently suffering through that. And I noticed that when you get people together to drink whiskey, not only do all of the social impediments that keep people from feeling connected seem to kind of melt away, and not only does the lubricant of people getting a little bit of alcohol in their system seem to lower inhibitions and help connections form, the, 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 uh, the social lubricant, if you will, um, but it seems to be almost like a synergy that grows beyond that. And, and people can feel connected and understand that they're part of a community and that there are people that care about them. And that's what this podcast is about, is about bringing people together. Unfortunately, though, I, I do see a lot of people online that are showing hate towards one another. And I, I don't like that. Uh, but it did make me realize that if a stranger can hate you online because they disagree with you about something, it's just as easy for me to love you, even though I don't truly know you. And that's why I sign off every podcast with the same sign off, and that is this. If you woke up this morning and you were unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you, and I'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk. Now all I can hear is that song. Glistening. Do, 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 do. Hey, don't mess up my hair, bro. They gotta see the douche poop. You've been on sets before. That felt very aggressive. I gotta be honest. That felt that felt like she might have been taking out some pinup aggression. Because we don't think about this a lot, but the distilleries were significantly affected by world war war war. The distilleries were significantly affected by wool. The distilleries were affected by World War. <laughs> You're gonna have to put this in the outtakes. <laughs>